Welcome to Globally Speaking, your program that explores everything and anything to do with language localization. Are you ready to dive into the most critical issues impacting global brands today? Globally Speaking is designed to educate, inform, and challenge everyone who's engaged in global communications. Your hosts for Globally Speaking are Renato Beninato and Michael Stevens. Learn more by visiting our website at www.globallyspeakingradio.com. And now, here are Renato and Michael. Hi, I'm Renato Beninato. And I am Michael Stevens. Today we have a very special guest with us. We're going to talk about a fascinating company from Australia. Well, we're talking about like rockets or something, right? Skyrocketing growth, something like that. Well, the interesting thing about our guest today is it's a company that went from zero to 10 million users in no time. It's almost as fast as Facebook. Yeah. And they decided very early on to put localization in their strategy. Why don't we get uh, Georgia to tell us about herself a little bit? Sure. Hey, I'm Georgia. And yeah, I work in localization and marketing at Canva. And yeah, so Canva is basically, I mean, our mission is really to democratize design and creation in total. So the way we're doing that right now is through our web application, which is a really easy online graphic design tool, essentially. Okay. And yeah, we've grown really quickly. But if you democratize it, everyone can do it. Essentially. But there's some problems with that, right? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Be, because then what are designers going to do? Because they were the only ones who knew how to use other products that are very intensive and all yeah, of that. Yeah, and... I guess we're not trying to kind of steal designers' work. We ah. kind of want to leave designers to do what they want to do, which is do proper design, professional design. This is for, you know, non-professional designers, people who have their own businesses. They want to make marketing materials. They want to maybe make birthday invitations, wedding invitations, that kind of thing. So it's kind of like everyday people who want to do good design and haven't been able to in the past. So give us a little background of the, what do they call them, the founding story of the company too, because that's Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so I guess Canva, I think the idea started maybe three or four years ago. And we've got three founders, so Mel, Cliff, and Cam. And basically that was Canva as a business, maybe three or four years ago, three people. Canva was essentially Mel's brainchild. She came up with it when she was teaching design. She was actually learning design at university and then was asked to come back and tutor design. And she kind of realized really quickly when she was teaching that designing was really, really difficult to do well. Becoming a professional designer is really, really complex process. Mm -hmm. And so she wanted to create a product that made that a lot easier and rolls a lot of different tools and industries into one really easy to use product. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's grown in the last three years to be like over a hundred people in, in two offices in two cities, one in Manila and one in Sydney, Australia. So yeah. And for a significant amount of time with your growth, you didn't have many other language options other than English. Is that No, right? yeah. We've been so, completely English speakers product focused on the US market essentially up until like six months ago. Yeah. And, and the impact that you guys had had to that point was roughly how many users? How? Yeah. So in that time, yeah, we grew to about, as you said, about 10 million users. And we kind of celebrated that that growth. I think we were on our team trip in Manila a few months ago and we that celebrated 10 million really years, fun which moment. was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was really cool. So I guess when we say 10 million, it sounds like this huge number and, you know, we've got three designs being created every second on Canva now, but that is, yeah, nowhere near where we want to be. Mel's vision and the founding team's vision is to make Canva a household product and a household name. And to do that, we need to go to a lot more than 10 million users. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that there are many fascinating things about the story and about the product. One of them is that you're an Australian company. Yeah. And I wonder why you chose to focus on European languages and Latin America before you went into your neighbors, into Chinese, Japanese, which are big design countries yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, good question. Actually, the first language that we focused on was Spanish and European Spanish. And that was purely based on the fact that we'd seen demand in that market. All the data that we had acquired up until that point all signs pointed to Spain and Spanish speaking markets. So that's where we started. And then naturally we thought, okay, if we're going to do Spain and Latin American Spanish, then it makes sense to do Brazil, Brazilian Portuguese, and then do French, German, Italian, and Polish. I think the other languages we've done. 
So I think it kind of just, because it's our, they're our first set of languages, we kind of wanted to do what was going to be easiest. So mm -hmm. like kind of Latin derived languages, we wouldn't have to solve as many problems with UI fonts and that kind of thing. And we could learn as much as possible with what we consider were the easiest languages to enter at first. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I usually, when we have conversations uh, with clients about what languages to try, naturally the Latin or Latin character set languages are among the easiest to try, but if you want to really cover all of them, you can choose one of the CJK, one of the double byte languages, Chinese, Japanese, or Korean. And you should also try to get some of the bidirectional languages, Arabic and Hebrew. Are you going into this direction in any way? We're definitely looking at, we're translating right now, actually, into traditional Chinese for Hong Kong and Taiwan. We're also doing Japanese at the moment. And bi-directional, we did look into it. And at first, I don't think we realized how big a task it was going to be to launch into bi-directional languages. You know, we really want to get into the Arabic speaking markets. It definitely makes sense for us. But the amount of development work required to completely flip our apps UI, we didn't actually have the resources at the time to mm -hmm. commit to it. So we're looking at it now, though. We're definitely looking at it now. So it sounds like it's part of Canva's DNA to be international. Essentially, And yeah. it's tied intimately to growth. So when you guys decided to go international, did you go according to a strict plan and follow that of what you were thinking or did the plan change along the way? Definitely changed. And I think actually everything at Canva changes all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that seems to be a tendency for growing companies. I think so. And I think you have to be like that. I think you have to accept that everything's going to change all the time because if you don't and you're failing and you're too attached to a certain project or you're too attached to a certain decision, you're just going to keep failing. I think you need when you're this small and you need to grow, you need to be happy to adapt. So you've been six months into this process. What is the biggest lesson learned that you've had so far? Good question. I think one of my biggest lessons was that if you want to keep a small team internally, which we seem to be making decisions to keep our team small internally, we've kind of had to lean on partners and third parties to scale out the process, right? And kind of externalize the process. So we don't want to be constantly hiring more and more and more people to manage more and more processes and more teams internally. We want to lean on other people. And I guess we figured that out firstly when we started working with some freelance translators. So we were managing them all separately. There were a kind of a team, but we did have to manage them all separately. And that was just for Spanish when we first launched. I realized that if we were going to be doing 20, 30, 50 languages this year, I definitely wasn't going to be able to myself manage that many freelancers for that many languages. It's a lot of people. It's, it's, it's a, a lot, lot of, of, lot of stuff. It's a lot of paperwork. You know, I was still kind of figuring out our translation management system and that's been a massive journey and figuring out like how to track everybody's, their word counts and their invoicing and all that kind of thing that just wasn't going to yeah. work. And so you had to prioritize things above that. Since you're not doing that, what is it that your internal people have spent time on related to translation we like to automate stuff. Okay. And I, a lot of the people I've spoken to at Lockworld, actually, I find that a lot of people aren't automating stuff. Mm -hmm. So even just like the handover between the translation into our web app, I've actually spoken to a lot of people and they, they have people manually doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Copy and pasting strings into yep. their web app every time that they do a new release or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we're releasing to production once a week. Soon it's going to be like twice a week. And so, yeah, it was really important for us to automate that whole process. It's very interesting because the difference between a legacy organization and a brand new organization is that you don't have the legacy, the yeah. challenges of the past and the this is the way we do things here. So you can be creative and innovative. So the first thing that you notice is that you didn't want to be managing process and task, that this is something that is repetitive that can be done by an outside partner, an LSP or another yeah. organization. How about your role internally? So besides being the bridge between the organization and your localization partner, how do you spend your time inside Canva? I guess I work with the team. So my role essentially is coordinating the team. We've got a few developers on the team now. We've now got a designer and we've also got an international growth person. So we're doing lots of growth projects. We're doing some engineering projects because actually when we started localizing, we thought, how are we going to make Canva we had lots of different admin systems mm -hmm. and part of our engineering timeline for the year has been to roll those admin systems into one and actually create like a CMS for Canva so that we can
can manage completely localized versions of the product. So I think down the line, the vision was to, you know, have the way Canva looks in Japanese or in Japan might be completely different to the way it looks in Spain and managed potentially by completely different people. The designs might be different. Even the UI could be different. That's a very interesting point because being a visual product, there are a lot of cultural elements that are yeah. associated with visuals and also calendars and festivities and, and mm -hmm. all different yeah, yeah. All is different that is that the world. who does that part of your localization process who adapts that element let's say you, you're in mexico you have a quinceañera mm -hmm. you're in china you have the chinese new year you're mm -hmm. in white day in japan exactly yeah black friday in the u.s <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're definitely still working that out. That is not something that we've got like a whole department working on or mm -hmm. anything like that. Right now, we're just testing stuff, testing to see what works, testing to see what makes a difference. And we're doing that at a few key markets. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully once we've got this admin system built, we will actually be able to facilitate this kind of... It's beautiful to see the flexibility being built in from the beginning for that vision. Like yeah. you guys are yeah. thinking so far ahead of where you'll be. It's encouraging. This is a historic problem. So I remember the first time I saw this was with HP when they started selling this inkjet printers and you received some sample photographic paper to make cards mm -hmm. and they would ship printers with software to print the image of Abraham Lincoln. Who cares right. about right. Abraham Lincoln <laughs> in Argentina or in Germany? Right? Yeah, yeah. So they started, they had a project to localize images for or icons. They, mm -hmm. they weren't called emoticons or icons or things like that at the time. I'm talking about mid 90s. And that's when they started doing this culturalization projects. Yeah. But this is very interesting. And I wonder if you have a community or if you use the community of users in giving you feedback for this kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, we definitely want to. That's definitely something I want to do. You know, we've got users in like 179 countries already. Mm -hmm. And they've, you know, up until now been using the product in English. But I'm sure that I can leverage a lot of the knowledge that's out Absolutely. there already. It's very interesting that you're already in 179 locales. And who are, just out of curiosity, who are the most active? Do you track that? Do you know what communities are the most active? Well, I'd say probably still right now the US is our most active because that's what we've been focused yeah. on. And obviously because we launched Spanish Next, that's one that's definitely skyrocketed. I mean, we've got almost half a million people on the app in Spanish. So because we've only just launched the next six or seven languages, it's still super early days, but we are, we're definitely tracking it all. Yeah. Is there a big difference in the process and the localization of your web platform and your app? Our web is our web application and yeah. then the app is just the iPad app. And we haven't chosen to localize that just yet. So we're basically just focusing on the core web app right now. Mm -hmm. And then depending on demand and, and I guess different competing priorities within the business, we'll see if we can localize the iPad app. Let's talk a little bit about brand because that mm -hmm. is important to you guys. How would you describe the Canva brand for those who don't know? I would describe the Canva brand as... It's a young brand. It's accessible, friendly, somewhat unassuming. <laughs> and yeah, that, that's probably how I describe it. Yeah. And have you had any changes to it since you've focused on international? Have you had any surprises that you've had to maybe recalibrate a bit or how you communicated things? Not really. There's been lots of different challenges with the way we phrased things and how, how we translated certain things we phrased because we use a lot of like in our UI, we try to be quite playful. So there's lots of like kind of puns and funny things that are- Those maybe, are the hardest. Maybe they're from they movies are. or quotes or something and like they're the hardest to translate. So I've had quite a few challenges with trying to like localize quotes or puns or because the way that we write, not just in the app, but in quite a lot of our content, it's quite quirky. So well, the part of the puns and the word plays, the important thing from a localization perspective is that you want to have a pun or a wordplay there. Yeah. Not necessarily a direct translation no. of that pun or a wordplay. And this is something that translators very often have a hard time understanding. Yeah. Is that if you have a pun or a wordplay, that's a placeholder telling you 
localize this to Into your something culture. Interesting, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Make it fun. You don't need to use the exact equivalent. Yeah, exactly. And the best translators, and some people will call this transcreation, but the best yeah. translators are the ones that are capable of understanding that a pun in an app or in a device means this is the place to put a pun. Yeah. <laughs> Have a creative one in your sometimes language. Sometimes they don't even realize it's a pun. Exactly. And then they just, then they just translate well, it. That's not a good translator then. <laughs> no. But Georgia, you communicate the launch of your product in how? Through email, social media? Yep, yeah. all of the above. How do people receive it when you... We had a great reception, actually. And we did a bit of a press launch as well. So we got quite a bit of buzz around simply just the launch because we're now available in, you know, languages of about over a billion people worldwide, which is pretty cool. But yeah, I think that I did have a little bit of a stuff up when I did the launch of the... It was actually seven languages. So... so the eighth language is English. Translate stuff up from stuff Australia. Stuff up is my favorite new term. What, just is saying. that not a thing for you guys? No, I think it's Australian. That's lovely. <laughs> what is it? What do you the, guys the say? The other phrase that I've picked up is sticky wicket. I like to use that as often that. as I can because that, I don't know what that is. to people in the US, it's a cricket reference. Okay. Uh, the sticky wicket of this. Oh. And it's when you can't knock down the wickets. But uh, is that stuff like meant up, to be an Australian thing? I've never no, no, no. It's that. British. Oh, right. But so stuff up is now going to be on my list now. Okay. They, what do you every say? Every time I make a stuff up, screw up. Screw up. Okay, that's, that's I, the nicer I screwed up. Of the two. The other I one, screwed up a little. <laughs> <laughs> and you had to go nasally, like, a, like an American. Okay. So what happened was we were launching in all these languages. I was sending out this email. It was like a launch email, you know, hey, to all of our existing users, hey, we're available in German, we're available in Portuguese, Polish, French, Italian. And I was managing these translations not through our translation management system that we normally use and the normal workflows and stuff. I was just doing it over email. And translation got lost. Most of them turned out fine, but unfortunately I used the wrong translation for the Polish email that I was sending out. And so I basically set up all these emails, sent them all off, scheduled them, went home for the day. And then I get a message from Mel, my boss, <laughs> the CEO on Slack being like, what's going on with Polish? Seems to be a lot of people tweeting, going a bit crazy online about, you know, some issue with an email or something, some translation. Can we just stop the email right now? So I rushed home, tried to figure out if I could pause it, but no, it had been sent out to thousands and thousands of people, unfortunately. So she was like, why don't you send an apology? I'm like, that's actually perfect. That's probably the best thing to do in this instance is to just apologize to people, say how embarrassed we were, you know, and try to rectify it by saying, why don't you get involved in helping us with the Polish translations in the future? Because you're our Polish users. Why don't you help us make Canva really great in Polish? So obviously this email that I was about to send out that's an apology to all our Polish users needed to be in perfect Polish because yeah. if I, yeah. if I stuffed that up, yeah. <laughs> if, I, if I screwed that, <laughs> then that would have just been pretty ridiculous, yeah. you know, doing it wrong again. So I worked overnight kind of with my translator and proofreaders and QA people to make sure this email was perfect. And what I did is I, just before I sent it out, I'm like, you know, I'm just going to pop it through Google Translate just to double check that there's, that's like my last, you know, gate. Yeah. So double checked and it kind of started off, like I'd written an email that was like, hey there, really sorry about that crappy translation. But the translation that I'd been given said, dear users at the very start. And so I kind of like freaked out being like, that's not the tone of, of the email at all that I wanted to send out. Yeah, yeah. And kind of not the tone of the brand. Not the tone of the brand. Yeah. We, we're normally a really casual brand. You know, not too casual. We're still professional, but yeah, we like right. to kind of be friends with our users. And so I thought, okay, this is completely way too formal. It's really not on brand. Contacted the translator and they actually wrote me this great breakdown, two paragraphs of text just about this dear users dear line, user, yeah. <laughs> yeah. which was really great. It really put my mind at ease and it was going, you know, in Poland, you don't want to be that informal. Like you're actually going to piss people off if you're that informal. And, yeah, you're, and if you're trying to apologize, yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you're trying to apologize culturally, you actually want to be a bit formal. You want to say, you know, we take this really seriously. I not Polish. I don't know cultural norms in Poland. So that was actually really, really yeah. great to and have someone, a native speaker, like explain that. Yeah. And as a business, you can't know everything about your customers and no matter how much you care for them to be able to get that kind of cultural education and insight, yeah. 
demonstrates even a professionalism and a greater care for your end users than Definitely. maybe even a mess up. What was the response like from it? And it was people? great. It was a really good response. So yeah. I sent it out. It was perfect. And yeah, we got lots of people back on Twitter being like, oh, we love you. Like, it's all good. Don't worry about it. Some people were like, is this a hoax? Like, were you just trying to like get a bit more publicity? <laughs> like, but now that you've mentioned it. <laughs> Sorry, maybe Germany. Maybe we do that for all of them. <laughs> so but actually, it can our, become a strategy. Yeah. Our apology email got like twice the open rate of the original email so yeah. what does that say so about the psychology work? of people i don't know yeah <laughs> yeah but you, you see here you have a couple of very interesting lessons from a globalization perspective first of all you checked before mm. you sent it yep yes Second which i didn't all, do the original time you have a great partner the individual translator who took the time to explain to you mm -hmm. and you worked in conjunction with the translator, one of the complaints that professional translators have is that they're not heard. Yeah. And we know thousands of professional translators who put a lot of effort and care into the things that they're doing. And the fact that you were able to be matched with a professional translator that was willing to give yeah. you that feedback uh, in a short period of time. For them to have the direct business impact for their client. Yeah, and That's we sent it back to them as well. And they were awesome. like, it's great. Like, oh. yeah, they were really happy about it. And the third lesson is that communication mm. generates business. And one of the things that I love about the concept of globalization and localization is that we see this as, I call it the enabler and the multiplier. So if you offer your product in multiple languages, you enable access to people who don't speak English. Definitely. Yeah. And you definitely... Because you have more people using your product, you're multiplying your revenue. So localization as an enabler and multiplier is something that people should think about strategically. But one of the great things that you have is also your speed, right? Mm -hmm. You are going at the speed of light. Skyrocketing. Skyrocketing. Skyrocketing, <laughs> skyrocketing your growth. localization, we are your trying growth. To go, yeah, we're trying to go fast. So it's been like six months and we're already in eight languages, including English now. That seems like a lot quicker than a lot of other companies are doing it, actually. Yeah. yeah, one of the challenges of waiting for Localize in today's environment where startups used to take years to flourish, now they take months. Mm. So if you wait too long and your product is successful, you get a ton of copycats. So localization is also a way for you to defend your product and your brand. Yeah, definitely. You've already... Yeah, I mean, we don't really like to focus on competitors at Canva. Like, it's just really not in our sites. We like to focus on our own product, innovating our own product and building our own team. It's not like our driver for localization, mm -hmm. but it's a great bonus yeah. that if we're getting into markets quickly, a lot of the time we can be first to market and we can eliminate not necessarily competitors that are there, but anyone who's going to come in and, and copy us if we're the first ones there, then, you know, we get that first to market advantage. Yeah. And I think there's some conversation out there about you can't go international fast enough. Yeah. And that's kind of the sentiment I think that we found, well, at least Mel, Cliff and Cam, the founders of Canva found before, even before I started, I think they had a lot of advice from advisors and investors and different people in similar situations in similar businesses that said, yeah, we wish we did it quicker. You know, we yeah. wish we internationalize quicker because not just getting into markets more quickly, but the changes you have to make internally into the product. If we had to do that a year or two down the line, the process would just be 10 times more complex. Yeah. So now that we are starting to think internationally now, we can build all of our new products with that in mind right. rather than having to come back and backfill everything two or three years down the line. Yeah. It's wonderful. And Georgia, we can just continue to talk all day. It's great. <laughs> I'm sure people can listen to more of you. You guys did a great launch video when you release these languages. Yeah. You are first and featured in it. You're speaking <laughs> yeah. Spanish. It's fabulous. <laughs> so if you want to see and listen to more of Georgia, check out the video. It's going to be in the show notes. We're thankful for this time. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun. This podcast was produced by Burns360. You can subscribe to Globally Speaking on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. Thank you for listening to Globally Speaking, brought to you by Moravia. We'd like to hear your comments, suggestions, and feedback. So until next time, please visit online at www.globallyspeakingradio.com.